So you've finished thinking and studying all of Shakespeare's Measure for Measure and now you're keen to delve into a different production. This time I'm going to show you um, key moments from the 2019 RSC production and show you how to reference some quite unusual moments within this film um, within an A-star essay. So stay tuned because you're watching Schofield on Shakespeare. I find the opening interesting. There is a kind of waltz in which a series of splendidly formally dressed couples dance most properly. There is nothing remotely sleazy or lewd about proceedings. All is measured, all is calm. However, when the music starts to get quicker, this Duke begins to look increasingly confused and bewildered. He must bring a halt to the proceedings and so shouts, Aeschylus! The music stops, dancers exit the stage, and five seconds or so later, the Duke introduces the topic of governance to a rather startled female Aeschylus. Our early impressions of the Duke here are simple. Could he simply be a killjoy? Someone determined to stop others having fun because he isn't having any. And make no mistake, this production is certainly full of characters having fun. Here you can see Mistress Overdone, an outrageous larger-than-life transvestite, laughing loudly, slamming her handbag into the first gentleman, following his impertinent question about her hips, which implicitly suggests that she has developed syphilis through far too much dirty sex. And here Lucio takes delight in Claudio and Juliet's sexual union by crudely bringing together his cigarette box and matches so that the audience and poor innocent Isabella are in no doubt about what has happened, as well as how much he enjoys talking about sex. Time now to think about how you might integrate a reference to the RSC 2019 production within an essay question. Namely the idea that the women in the play are dominated by the men and the extent to which this is correct. Here's a sample paragraph on this topic. It's difficult to argue against the idea that the women in the play are dominated by the men. There is poor Isabella, who is repeatedly intimidated and threatened by Angelo before being left speechless and aghast in the RSC 2019 production following the Duke's bolt from the blue marriage proposal. There is poor Mariana, who has been manipulated and dominated by men seemingly for her entire life. Prior to the events of the play, she was abandoned by Angelo, resulting in appalling stagnation and miserable passivity. During the play itself, she is used as a tool within the Duke's highly elaborate plan and seems to have no voice other than to say, yes, please. However, there are moments of female agency, particularly within modern productions in which a female actor takes on a male role. This inevitably alters the power dynamics providing additional authority for someone who appears female on stage, e.g. the female Aeschylus in the RSC 2019 production, but also the Duke in a 2021 production at the Sam Wanamaker Playhouse. Within Act 1, Scene 2 of the play, there is also a female character who seems prepared to exchange banter and lewd jokes with the men and isn't afraid to speak her mind, Mistress Overdone as well as having the self-assurance required to brush off the first gentleman's insinuating question about her hips, and in the RSC 29 production, she goes one step further by slamming her handbag into the speaker's chest. She isn't afraid to stick up for newly arrested Claudio, declaring him worth 5,000 of you all. I think the comic scenes are important in the play, and the versions which choose to cut them, such as the 2006 Kumar film, lose something important and run the danger of becoming too intense. In the RSC 2019 production, as well as the obvious laughs from elbow silly malapropisms, the director is keen to paint Froth as a similarly ridiculous caricature. Here you can see him attempting a forward role when referred to, which goes horribly wrong. And when he does speak more than a phrase, it is clear from his very slow, deliberate, shaky speaking and facial twitches that he is incredibly drunk. So in this production and in Shakespeare's original text, it is clear that we are not intended to worry too much about what exactly may have happened to Elbow's wife. Instead, we are encouraged to have a breather from the strangely disturbingly harsh sentencing of Claudio 
and the slightly odd decision from the Duke to put Angelo in power and disguise himself as a friar. We know that we are watching a group of silly characters. One of whom is particularly fun and anarchic, as evidenced in this production by Pompey's cheeky thrust while saying the word come, making it abundantly clear that we are talking about sex. Our role is simply to sit back and laugh at the silliness. Act 2, Scene 3 is also worth a look, given the directorial decision to have Juliet not just obviously pregnant, but on the very verge of giving birth. She has been plonked into a wheelchair for this interrogation by the friar. Is sweating and breathing heavily, and even seems to be starting to get contractions. This is clearly not the time for repeated questioning or lecturing or indeed abrupt insensitivity seen here in the Duke's revelation that Claudio is going to die the very next day. So the presentation of Juliet on the verge of giving birth reflects badly on both Angelo and the Duke. We are reminded of Angelo's choice of Claudio as the person to make an example of, which seems particularly heartless in these circumstances. As for the Duke, we are unconvinced by his effectiveness as a supposed man of God. Although it's worth pointing out that during Shakespeare's time, friars would have been viewed with suspicion and were frequently objects of mockery within contemporary productions, although not in this particular play. Within the chapter entitled Shakespeare's Duke in Disguise, Rosalind Miles explores Jacobean responses to friars on the stage. She points out that for an audience of 1604, real friars would have been at most a distant memory and suggests that Shakespeare and other dramatists were drawing upon a purely literary tradition, which would typically consist of attacks on friars and mistrust of religious orders. Shakespeare may have been aware of the tradition of mocking friars, but ultimately he may have chosen this particular disguise as a neutral opportunity to give the Duke immediate access to Isabella and ensure immediate trust. Rosalind Miles again. It turns the Duke into the only kind of man to whom Isabella and Mariana would have paid any attention. Isabella could turn to no one but this holy man. Yet in this production and at this moment, we get the impression that this Friarcum Duke, this person may not be someone you'd want to turn to in a moment of crisis. If he doesn't have the emotional nous to realise that unleashing insensitive bombshells about partners dying the next day or hectoring someone having contractions may not be such a good idea, then why would you let him loose on any other vulnerable women? Now for a particularly fascinating moment involving Angelo in Act 2, Scene 4. Alone on stage for his opening soliloquy, he slowly takes down his trousers to reveal a cilice consisting of a spiked chain. This practice is used by certain members of Opus Dei, a religious sect founded in 1928, in order to, in the words of Sarah Cassidy, a senior female figure in Opus Dei, suppress desires and atone for sins. So what are we supposed to make of this revelation that Angelo indulges in Opus Dei-esque flesh and desire mortifying practices? Well, on the one hand, many of us are likely to think, what a weirdo. Yes, Lucio Pompey and co may seem to spend too much time talking, joking and participating in sex, but at least they are open about their desires and pastimes. And together, they seem part of a broader community of fun-loving members. However, Angelo seems isolated from the rest of Vienna in his obsessive self-moderation, and this revelation that he secretly disfigures his inner thigh distances him further from the vibrant energy and normality of the rest of the city. That said, given the obvious excesses in the city, some part of us may admire Angelo for his determination to suppress his inner urges and try not to get sucked into the maelstrom of sexual depravity. Though, might someone who uses spiked chains on their own flesh also end up being disturbingly sadomasochistic in the bedroom if ever tempted into a sexual encounter with another person? Might this revelation make us feel even more nervous for Isabella following Angelo's indecent proposal in the same scene?
and Isabella's reaction in this production is also fascinating. Following Angelo's explicit indecent proposal and violent manhandling, she starts to shake and becomes frozen in position. Her eyes roll upwards and one hand stays on her mouth with the other impotently protective in front of her vagina. It takes her some time to recover from this spasm following Angelo's exit. So what do we make of this reaction? Well, it really emphasizes how Isabella has closed herself off from all thoughts and ideas of sexual activity, hence her sudden and uncontrollable contractions. It is her body reacting to something utterly alien to her beliefs and experience. Ironically, though, these spasms may point to unnatural repression. After all, human contact and mutual sexual encounters are entirely natural parts of the human condition and thus align her on one small level to her predator, the one who in this production aims to subdue his own desires for the use of that deliciously pain-providing, skin-ripping Celise. Time now to think about how you might integrate a reference to the RSC 2019 production within an essay. This particular essay asks you to consider whether the play ends happily and whether it has a lot to say about death. The play certainly contains moments in which death seems strangely prominent, at least for the modern viewer. The Duke's speech to Claudio in Act 3, Scene 1 stands out for its staggeringly depressing personification of death, in which Claudio is branded death's fool and told that death unloads thee. The Duke is ostensibly there as a friar to prepare Claudio for death. But the fact that he does this by making life seem worthless and utterly depressing, rather than presenting a Christian New Testament perspective referencing the benevolence of God and the hope of heaven, seems odd. Another factor is that the audience know that the Duke potentially has the power to save Claudio's life. He would simply have to remove his disguise and inform Angelo that his tenure was over. In a similar way, in Act 2, Scene 4, Angelo seems to dwell on death more than is strictly necessary. He tells Isabella that if she refuses to yield up the body to my will, Claudio won't just die, but will be tortured, his death draw out to lingering sufferance. What we are seeing here is that men with power in Vienna are unscrupulously willing to reference death in order to intimidate and manipulate other people. However, referencing death is only one of a number of tactics employed, which on stage will also include physical intimidation. This is seen in the 2019 RSC production when Angelo grabs hold of Isabella to illustrate his determination to carry out his threat to draw out Claudio's death to lingering sufferance. Her body spasms in shock, which doesn't deter Angelo one jot. In a world in which men with power entirely dominate the women, any manoeuvre which will help the male achieve its goals may be employed. I rather like Anthony Byrne's portrayal of the Duke, especially in this act. In the opening minutes of Act 3, Scene 1, the Duke has some stunningly depressing nihilistic lines to deliver, including, Merely thou art death's fool, happy thou art not, friends hast thou none, and thou hast nor youth nor age. Given the crazily bleak nature of his long speech, you would imagine that the primary effect would be to leave Claudio depressed beyond measure and even more isolated from the warmth of humanity. Yet somehow Anthony Byrne manages to give the impression that he really cares about Claudio whilst delivering the aforementioned miserable lines. How? Well, partly through openly expressing his affection as seen here in his tender stroking of Claudio's cheek. Partly through close physical proximity, implying a degree of equality of humanity and a desire for companionship. And partly through, and this is crucial, seeming to be speaking as much about himself and the human condition in general as Claudio. Following the lines on screen now, the Duke becomes tearful and it would seem as though he is reflecting about his own position more than Claudio's. Within this interpretation, we get the impression that the Duke is reflecting on what he himself has to live for. He is significantly older and presumably richer than Claudio, and how older age makes it so much harder to enjoy life, irrespective of status and wealth. So within the RSC 2019 production, 
the opening moments of Act 3, Scene 1 become somehow a shared expression of human vulnerability, even though the vast majority of lines are spoken by just the Duke, rather than a ruthless deconstruction of Claudio's existence and what he doesn't have to live for. Moving on to Isabella. Certainly pupils I have taught have on occasion tried to dismiss her as some kind of psychotic repressed nutcase. Or at least they have wondered about her following her use of sadomasochistic imagery when responding to Angelo's demand for the treasures of her body in Act 2, Scene 4, and her suggestion that Claudio's demand for her to save his life is a kind of incest. In this production, she certainly comes across as somewhat repressed and extreme on occasion. I've already referred to her striking spasms whilst being manhandled by Angelo in Act 2, Scene 4. And here you can see her offering Claudio her rosary beads to help him prepare for his death, albeit a sign of devout religious belief rather than extremism, perhaps. However, Claudio's expression is telling here, following Isabella's suggestion that a comparison can be made between a brother asking a sister to consider sleeping with a man to save his life and incest. He looks incredulous. And we as the audience increasingly begin to side with him, not necessarily thinking that Isabella should sleep with Angelo, but that she may be slightly unhinged or at least a little odd. Another example of Isabella's extremes, or just her passionate nature, is seen in the way she falls dramatically to the ground, following the Duke's request to speak to her by and by in a conversation which would be to her own benefit. She sobs wildly on the ground, whilst the brief conversation between Claudio and the Duke continues in the background. Note that the film director has chosen to showcase Isabella with this camera angle in a way which is not possible for those in the auditorium, whose ability to see her will depend on the position of their seats. The effect of this is to keep the focus on Isabella in a way which is much harder to do without the availability of multiple different cameras. In the theatre, we would expect to turn our attention more exclusively to Claudio, as the Duke claims that Angelo was only testing her, didn't mean what he said, and so he should prepare himself to die. But here, we cannot take our eyes off Isabella, who moves from crying bitterly to praying fervently. And indeed, she is still deep in prayer, even after the Duke has dismissed Claudio and started to speak. So what should we make of Isabella in this scene and this production? Well, there is no doubt that she is extremely religious and devout, thus making the Duke's marriage proposal in Act 5 seem all the more unpalatable and inappropriate. But more than that, she is so spiritual and otherworldly that she is literally unable to cope with unforeseen, unex unexpected human interactions. She falls to the ground, she spasms, she prays, and... For the majority of the audience, she seems rather pitiful and difficult to engage with. Greg Duran is quite interesting when talking about Isabella and her relationship with Claudio. He references the fact that Isabella plans to join a convent in which nuns are not permitted to see any men, even if family members. Could this decision in some way reflect upon the poor quality of Isabella's family relationships? Indeed, if she were so close to Claudio, would she really be on the point of making a decision which will result in her never seeing him ever again? Duran's angle also sheds some light upon Isabella's strangely excessive tirades. Does it partly stem from simmering past sibling tensions as well as natural sensitivity about her chastity? But I wonder what would happen if if you have less of a relationship, if you have maybe not really even been close since you were eight, nine, ten, and what you later say ab about him, what's sort of revealed in what you say about him is perhaps underlying what you actually think of his rather libertine behaviour. Yes. And maybe from your point of view, from, from Claudio's point of view, You've, you've just lost a kind of vocabulary of, of mm. conversation between you, and you haven't had that for a long time. So it's, mm. so the conversation's more stilted. 
uh, you're more suspicious of each other and your agendas, maybe. I wonder whether that would be something interesting to play. In this production, Isabella seems a little strange. Lucio seems a cat. Entering to find that Pompey has been arrested, he tries to sneak, sneak away before being seen. He favours extravagant gestures with his golf club. Here he takes an enormous swing to illustrate the absent Duke's feeling for the sport, implicitly the sport of sex rather than golf. And in an intriguing change, he exits the scene extremely hastily when Kate Keepdown appears with his baby in a pram and starts to run after him. Note that Kate Keepdown doesn't actually appear in the original text. She is only mentioned once by Mistress Overdone, who explains to Aeschylus, as she has been arrested for being aboard, that Lucio informed against her, and yet he himself fathered an illegitimate child with one of her prostitutes, Kate Keepdown. But as you can see in this production, Kate Keepdown does appear and even repeats one of Mistress Overdone's phrases. Moreover, her baby is also present. And there is another intriguing moment when the Duke has a few perplexing moments peering, trying to soothe the baby until Kate returns abruptly to wheel the pram off stage. So what of these changes to the production? Well, just as the, the flashbacks to Mariana and Angelo as a couple in the 2006 Kumar film emphasise the humanity of the Duke's seemingly out of the blue, slightly bizarre plan. Here, the presence of Kate Keepdown will make his treatment of Lucio in Act 5 seem less spiteful. Yes, in Act 5, the Duke suggests that slandering a prince deserves the more severe punishment, but audiences in this production are also likely to recall his presence when the effects of Lucio's debauchery were explicitly shown here in Act 3, rather than just talked about. The audience will remember that the Duke was on stage when a mother entered with a crying baby, and they will recall that Lucio simply ran off rather than take any responsibility. His sentence, therefore, that Lucio should marry Kate Keepdown seems all the more reasonable in this production, even if Kate Keepdown's clothing very much confirms her position as a prostitute. Much of human life is about deception. Do you agree? Here's my response, which references the RSC production. An initial response to this question is likely to veer towards agreeing with this statement. For instance, the Duke deceives everyone about his identity for the majority of the play, and also instigates a fiendishly complicated plan in which Angelo will be deceived. Angelo has clearly deceived everyone, including himself, about his own potential for sensuality. And there is even an argument that this point could be applied to Isabella. Her references to keen whips and stripping herself to death seem to point at repressed desires. In Act 3, Scene 2, Pompey clearly feels that Lucio has deceived him in relation to their friendship. Following his arrest, he spies comfort and cries bail as his friend enters the stage. However, Lucio responds with mocking references to Caesar and bombards his former ally with a series of breathless rhetorical questions totally devoid of any sympathy or care. And in the RSC 2019 production, Lucio's disinterest in his friend is shown in him trying to sneak off stage the very second he spots him in chains. So there is clearly plenty of deception within the play. But this is not quite the same as saying that much of the human life within the play is about deception. Such a statement would seem to imply that within everyday human interactions, deception frequently takes place. That the characters view deception as an essential tool to be employed on a daily basis. This is clearly not the case for characters such as Claudio, Isabella, Angelo, Aeschylus and Elbo. The reason Claudio has been arrested is precisely because he has not practised any deception in relation to his relationship with Juliet. Whilst Isabella only ever wanted a simple life with strict restraint. Meanwhile, Angelo may have been deceived about his own human potential for sexual urges, but until becoming enthralled by Isabella, was universally thought of as a straightforwardly simple, unwavering pedant when it came to the law. 
The opening song within Act 4, Scene 1 is not sung by a boy, as specified in Shakespeare's text, but a woman. This perhaps broadens the scope and points to the potential wider abandonment of women by men. It is not a one-off to find a man with eyes that do mislead the morn whilst... Mariana's passivity is stressed with her remaining seated and not moving throughout the song, even as the Duke enters. This is a woman who has been symbolically paralysed and transformed in the epitome of inertia following her rejection by Angelo. And by extension, this bed swap plot may end up benefiting her as much as anyone, in spite of initially seeming suspiciously convenient for both the Duke and Angelo. I wonder whether the replacing of the Duke's speech about the burdens and problems experienced by those in authority with an instrumental version of the Take O oh, Take Those Lips Away song also serves to retain a more compassionate focus on Mariana rather than the Duke's ego self-philosophizing. Instead of Mariana's acceptance just being taken for granted, the music and moving darker lightning indirectly remind us of her past suffering and allows this to take the stage rather than the Duke's self-obsessed, disguised, induced soliloquy. It is also amusing to watch the vigorous way Mariana marches towards the Duke post-conferring with Isabella, and the nervous way the Duke pauses after saying, welcome. It seems a recognition of the delicacy of the request, and that potentially Mariana might be furious with any man for making presumptions about her willingness to have sex. Other moments of interest in this production include the portrayal of Abhorson. He seems somewhat crazed as he justifies his description of the hangman profession being a mystery in a strong Welsh accent. It's worth pointing out that the word mystery had multiple meanings during Shakespeare's time. As illustrated in these definitions taken from Shakespeare's words.com, essentially he is keen to stress that being a hangman is something deeper and more special and profound than any old profession. It requires great skill and very few people understand what the role is really about. However, his proof rather strangely talks about the fact that hangmen can benefit financially from the clothing of the person being executed. In this context, the thief represents the hangman who recognises the sell-on value of clothing that doesn't fit him. Of course, if it does fit him, then all the better. Abhorson's manic craziness results in Pompey sharing a God, what is this guy on? Look with the audience, resulting in an additional laugh. Abhorson's craziness is confirmed by the manic way he brandishes his hangman's axe in the air when instructing Pompey to bring Barnardine hither. With such a melodramatic, manic figure in charge of executions in Vienna, it is harder to take the whole notion of a death sentence too seriously. With this buffoon in charge, now aided by an opportunistic joker such as Pompey, it somehow seems unlikely that any prisoners will come to too much harm. Talking of Pompey, he also gets a laugh at the beginning of Act 4, Scene 3, when he self-consciously ad-libs and draws attention to his pun about peaches, which the modern audience is unlikely to fully understand. As confirmed by the ever-helpful Shakespeare'sWords.com, peach can not just mean a colour or a fruit, but can also be used as a verb, similar to the verb we understand nowadays in peach. In this context, Mr Caper has just ended up in jail due to his debt to Master Threepile, the fabrics merchant. The former was unable to pay for his four, four suits of peach-coloured satin, which denounces him, peaches him as a poor man, a beggar. With the audience likely to be rather confused by the barrage of allegorical type names such as Master Rash, Master Caper and Master Deepval, Pompey's unexpected metatheatrical departure from the script gives the audience something easy to laugh at and helps maintain the relaxed, slightly chaotic, bawdy feel of the prison. I previously referenced the silly, melodramatic way Abhorson held his hangman's axe aloft. Well, here you can see the recalcitrant Barnardine mimicking the same motion, 
whilst continuing his glorious non-cooperation with the authorities in relation to his life. In some ways, Barnardine just seems a more extreme version of Vienna in the way that so many seem to hold many of the laws and justice systems in contempt. Or, in the words of the Duke in Act 1, Scene 2, liberty plucks justice by the nose and the baby beats the nurse. The fact that he can openly mock someone who you would suppose would be feared, if not necessarily respected, highlights the lack of good order and respectful morality under the Duke's reign, and hence the need for someone like Angelo. But this Barnardine doesn't just do mimicry. He does farting from his smelly, sweaty cell. And he can be violent too, seen here with a threatening thug expression and his hand tightly grasping the Duke's cloak around the neck, having lost patience with the Duke's repeated insistence that he has to die that day and should prepare himself accordingly. I think one of the reasons Barnardine has become such a cult figure within Shakespeare, in spite of, or perhaps because of, his comparative lack of lines, is because he just doesn't give a shit. Whoever he is talking to, whatever their status, he couldn't give a damn. And in most productions, you would imagine the Duke to be pretty put out by this, as he is here. Released from Barnardine's grip, and with the latter safely back down in his cell, he shows his frustration by impotently shouting his comment about Barnardine having a gravel heart as a direct insult rather than a saddened or shocked observation down into his pit. As with other interpretations, notably the Globe 2004 production, some fun is had with Ragazine's head. Here you can see it squirting liquid into the Duke's right ear, causing him to emit a loud ah and the audience to laugh at the grotesqueness of it all. But as you might expect, having seen her spasms in act two, it is Isabella's reaction to the supposed death of Claudio, which provides one of the dramatic highlights of this act. She moves around the stage increasingly haphazardly, before running to the front, ripping off her nun's headdress and kneeling down to beat her chest furiously and cry out her famous exclamations, unhappy Claudio, wretched Isabel, injurious world, most damned Angelo. She then seems to have some kind of fit, falling further to the ground with her mouth wide open and four fingers disturbing the inside. The Duke quietly shushes Isabella manages to lift her upper body from the floor before cradling her. His voice is aimed to be soothing and reassuring. With the Duke returning the next day, there is a chance, if not for all to be put right, after all, Claudio is apparently dead, but for justice to be served. Isabella is calmer by the end of the scene, but her reaction both to Angelo's manhandling in Act 2 and her fit here raise important questions about her mental state. Are these reactions simply the natural consequence of appalling once in a lifetime circumstances? Or do they suggest greater underlying vulnerabilities, thus making the Duke's proposals towards the end of Act 5 all the more unpalatable? A funny play. Do you agree? Here's my response, which references the RSC production. It can be tempting to focus on the intense, tense scenes which stem from Angelo's attempt to sleep with Isabella and conclude that Measure for Measure is predominantly a serious drama, to use modern parlance, than a comedy. And yes, we are gripped whilst observing Isabella as she finally realises Angelo's intent. And yes, the confrontation between Claudio and Isabella in Act 3, Scene 1 stuns and appalls in equal measure as sister turns on brother with extraordinary vituperation. But it would be wrong to focus slow, solely on these scenes, as there is no doubt that the play includes some extremely funny moments, particularly on stage, as opposed to just being read within a text. As directors continually wrestle with how to get around the fact that modern audiences may not fully understand some of the language. In Act 4, for instance, there is the spectacle of state executioner Abhorsen claiming his brutal profession is a mystery and of audiences, audiences laugh at any notion of aggrandizing such a hideous job, 
particularly when, in the RSC production of 2019, Abhorsen is a manic Welshman, prone to waving his hangman axe around in the air at regular intervals. Barnardine, famously labelled a comic genius by Harold Bloom, is another character from Act 4 who invariably gets numerous laughs. We laugh at the discrepancy between his perilous situation, his execution has been imminent for some time, and his glorious rowdy disdain, seen in his labelling those who try to bring him to the gallows as rogues. It is particularly satisfying and amusing that he completely blanks the otherwise all-conquering Duke. Modern audiences in particular may feel uncomfortable with the amount of power he wields, and so are delighted when, for a change, he doesn't manage to get his way and secure his head. The RSC 2019 production makes Barnardine's rejection of the Duke even more amusing. The former gives the latter a much needed throttling, indicating that moments of violence can temporarily triumph against endless machinations and secretly held power. It could be argued that to some extent Lucio steals the show in this final act, and certainly his appearances in this production provided plenty of laughs for the live audience. For the opening minutes, he is positioned on a balcony at the back of the stage and holds, holds forth from there. In this scene, he cannot resist intervening and interjecting whatever the occasion. He loves the sound of his voice too much and its effect on others. Never mind that he is annoying the hell out of the Duke. He's getting laughs and holding forth on his stage. Even when busted and in a perilous state after unhooding Friar Lodowick and discovering the Duke, he still manages to provoke laughs. Here he daintily produces a handkerchief before meticulously positioning it on the floor to ensure his trousers don't get dirty when kneeling to ask for the Duke's pardon. This man is a dandy and will stay a dandy, even when on the verge of being sentenced to a gruesome death. This director increases the focus on Lucio in the scene by once again bringing Kate Keep down on stage as he did in Act 3. Remember that Kate is only mentioned in the original text, but including her on stage in this production confirms categorically what some of the effects can be of unchecked male sexual activity. And also provides comedy in the splendid contrast between Lucio's dapper gentleman's attire and Kate's lurid prostitute wares. Note the hands on hips here from Kate. One senses that when the pair are left together and married, Lucio may find himself at the receiving end of some well-deserved verbal and probably physical blows. Barnardine, of course, gets a few laughs when he enters the stage to be unexpectedly pardoned. Here you can see him laughing heartily, not at being pardoned, but actually beforehand when the Duke tells him that he is condemned. Here is a character who doesn't change throughout the play and is straightforward to understand. He is simply someone who scorns authority and actually rather enjoys his comparatively utterly limited existence. And what are the proposals from the Duke? Well, with the first one, there is the quick look of utter incredulity from Isabella in the midst of a relieved, passionate hug with Claudio. For the second proposal, the Duke waits for some time with his hand aloft, hoping that she might take it, but probably knowing in his heart of hearts that she will not. The stage is cleared with the others heading off to the palace. The spotlight is on the two of them. The last moment of the film production of the play shows a close-up of Isabella, her head twisted upwards in abject misery. Do we sense that there will be coercion? And even though the very idea is hateful, she will need to marry this man against her will? For a play that ends happily, measure for measure, has a lot to say about death. Do you agree? Depending on the production, one might argue that a more accurate statement about the play could be this. For a play that ends unhappily, Measure for Measure doesn't have a great deal to say about death. For instance, how happy is the ending? There are at least two forced marriages. Lucio and Angelo are forced to marry women they have openly vilified. And then there is the relationship between the Duke and Isabella. 
in the Globe's RSC 2019 production, there is no question that Isabella is enormously unhappy about receiving the Duke's proposals. The final moment of the play sees a close-up of her in half-darkness, head twisted to one side in abject misery. Such a reaction is unsurprising, of course, given that she now knows the Duke deceived her about virtually everything, including his status as a friar, and most unnecessarily of all, about the death of her brother. She was also publicly humiliated by him whilst pleading for justice against Angelo, with at one point the Duke calling her a fond wretch, mad as I believe no other, and calling for her to be sent to prison. It is very difficult to describe a potential relationship between the two as a happy ending, notwithstanding the fact that in Jacobean times, the opportunities for any woman to become a king or duke's wife would be seen as life-changingly desirable. As for the references to death, it is notable that within the final scene, all of the death sentences are rescinded. So yes, there are some initial flurries and concerns following the Duke's dramatic sentencing, Angelo dies for Claudio's death, but ultimately the end of the play seems to see a return for life as it was at the beginning, albeit with some stark warnings for those who impregnate. Vienna can return to being a place of lax governance, where liberty is generally free to pluck justice by the nose. This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare production, exploring a key interpretation of the play and giving you moments from all five acts and showing you how to weave in references within an A-star, A-level essay. Many thanks for watching.